There once was a man who was an eyewitness to the best, most perfect life ever lived. There once was a man whose best friend was the Son of God. They worked together, they ate dinner together, they talked. I mean, it was an actual, real friendship. And this man, he literally saw miracles with his own eyes and he heard these radical teachings and he followed this friend, this leader who ended up changing the world forever. Fast forward a few years, his best friend's been arrested and murdered. His life is turned upside down. It's kind of a mess. But he has seen the truth. He has seen this light firsthand. And so he sits and underneath this mysterious direction, directly from God, he writes down the story of all that he had witnessed. This is that story. Easter is the one Sunday where you know exactly what the pastor is going to talk about. And that's because most of us, regardless of what we might believe about God, have at some point been confronted with this story in our lives. And some of us, maybe like me, you believe, and maybe you have since you were a kid. Uh, but for others of us, maybe you used to believe. But because your experience either with a church or with a Christian wasn't all that good or wasn't that life-giving, now maybe as a result, you can't believe even if you wanted to believe. Whatever we believe, we all have our reasons for it. But today I'd like to help us understand, you know, the story of Easter a little bit better and, and maybe why it might help and matter for your life. So since we all believe something, let me begin by asking you this. Why do you believe what you believe about Jesus? I mean, have you ever really stopped to examine and answer the question, why I believe what I believe? Let me ask it another way. What has happened in your life up to this point to lead you to what you believe about Jesus? Because I wonder sometimes if our opinion of Christianity or of Jesus has been tied into something that has nothing to do with him. You know, and if you've ever had a bad experience with a church or a Christian, and, and many people have, then that could be the case. But when we examine Jesus for who he really is and for what he did and for how he acted, and according to those who knew him best, his close friends and eyewitnesses, then, then most people, when they examine that, they, they come to the same conclusion. I mean, almost everybody that I've met they like Jesus. I mean, what's not to like about Jesus? He's loving, he's caring, he's gracious, he's patient, he's kind, he's gentle. He, he, he adds value to women, to children, to every person, no matter what they've done. He brings value to them. Uh, he has wisdom that will help our life. Most people like Jesus. They just don't like some of the things that his followers do. And so maybe it's possible that right now you believe something about Jesus that has nothing to do with who he really is, it has more to do with your own experiences. Now, at Easter, just to be clear, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And Easter actually points us to the answer for a question that everybody should be asking. In fact, it's probably the most important question that any of us could ever ask, and it's this. Who exactly is Jesus? Who do we believe him to be? I mean, most people think that at least he was a great man, a, a great philosopher, a great teacher. Maybe you even believe that he was somebody to pattern your life after. But the resurrection is what convinced his first century followers that he was more than a man, that he was their Messiah, the Son of God, sent to deliver them. But it wasn't his teaching that convinced them, and it wasn't all of the miracles it, what convinced those who knew him best that he was the son of God and the savior of the world was his resurrection from the dead. And his resurrection has been convincing people ever since. And it's important that you know that we don't believe Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible says so. It's much better than that. We believe because those who knew him best and saw him, who were eyewitnesses of him, all went on record to say that they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. They were all witnesses who went on to document what they had seen and heard and experienced. 
We believe because of Matthew, a follower of Jesus who was a Jewish man who wrote down all of the accounts that he saw. And we believe because of Peter, who, who was another follower of Jesus, who, who gave his account to a man named Mark. And now we have the Gospel of Mark, but it's really Peter's story of what he saw Jesus do. We believe because of a doctor named Luke, a Greek man who, who was investigating Christianity and he wanted to know what he could verifiably prove. And so after investigating and, and, and interviewing all the eyewitnesses, he comes to his own account and he writes an orderly account of Jesus's life. We believe because of guys like James, who was the brother of Jesus. And what would it take for your brother to convince you that he was God? I mean, that, that's incredible. But all of Jesus's brothers and sisters and even his own mom, Mary, believe Jesus was the Son of God. And we believe because of Paul, who, who started out as a persecutor of the church. And what would it take to convince him, who was set out to destroy it, to become one of them and to start churches and to share the faith with others? He saw Jesus resurrected on the road to Damascus. We believe because of these eyewitnesses, these brave men who all documented what they saw and what they heard, they protected it and they passed it on for future generations. And centuries later, their writings would be joined together into what we now refer to as the Bible. But before there was ever a Bible, there were the eyewitness accounts. Men and women who were there to see it for themselves and who said something happened on that very first Easter Sunday that changed everything. They were there to see Jesus' greatest miracle and perhaps the clearest sign to point to who Jesus really was. We believe Jesus rose from the dead because all the eyewitnesses say so. And besides that, the story of Jesus isn't even worth telling outside of the resurrection. I mean, if there's no resurrection, then, then Jesus is just another wannabe Messiah who went off the rails and should have just faded into history like all the others. So the fact that we even have their story tells us something significant happened that not just changed history, but has the potential to change your life and my life. And the, and the people who are closest to Jesus tell us their story, and they're so honest about their experiences. And it's one of the reasons that you should take what they say seriously, because they don't write themselves into the story as heroes. They actually all say they were doubters. None of them believed. None of them thought that Jesus would rise from the dead. They all expected Jesus to do exactly what dead people do. Stay dead. Nobody expected a resurrection. Nobody was standing outside of the tomb counting down from 10 on Sunday morning. Nobody, nobody. every, every single person that had been devoted to him and, and who had followed him for all of those years, after he died, they all felt as if they had misplaced their faith. They had all thought, I've been fooled. Now that he's dead, he can't be who he claimed to be. You can't crucify the resurrection and the life. You can't execute God's Messiah, who, who the Jews had been waiting on for hundreds of years. You can't put the Son of God to death. Now, the other person who, who was a follower of Jesus and who shares his account uh, of Jesus' experiences was a man named John. He was an eyewitness of both the crucifixion and the resurrection. And he details both for us in his gospel but, but like all the others who followed Jesus, John didn't expect a resurrection. He wasn't expecting a crucifixion. Now, John was expecting a king. John tells us that shortly before all this, when Jesus raised Lazarus back to life, that all the people who saw it wanted to make Jesus their king. Uh, because for them, this was a miracle that went beyond all the other miracles. Lazarus hadn't been dead for only, you know, for a few hours. No, he had been dead for four days. So this was an undeniable act of God's power for all who saw Jesus had authority over life and death. So there was this movement of support where many people believed in Jesus to be their Messiah. And so as Jesus makes his way a couple miles outside of Jerusalem from the city of Bethany into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, all the crowd knows that he's, he's coming and, and there's already so much patriotic zeal in the city for Passover as they all think back centuries uh, before to how God used Moses to deliver them from their bondage in Egypt. And so their hope is that now with Jesus as their king, Maybe this is the year, maybe this is the Passover that he'll take off his rabbinic robes and he'll put on the crown and, the, and, and, and he'll be the king and he'll deliver them from their bondage to Rome. So, so Jesus, as he enters the city, he and his disciples, they're, they're met by thousands of people who are waving palm branches and who are calling him their Lord and who are declaring him to be their king. 
But all of that makes Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees, certain they have to put a stop to him now. They have too much to lose and too many people are following Jesus. So they had to act fast. And so they had to wait for the perfect moment to get Jesus away from the crowd so they could arrest him and execute him. But it would be one of Jesus' own disciples, a man named Judas Iscariot, whose political motivations would be manipulated by these religious leaders in order to get to Jesus because more than most, Judas was ready for Jesus to proclaim himself king and Messiah. Judas was a zealot, which was a group of people who were advocating a military overthrow of Rome. And so after following Jesus for three and a half years, Judas has become convinced Jesus is their Messiah. He's their deliverer. He's the one they've been waiting for. So, But the only problem was that Jesus would never step out and proclaim himself king. But now with all the support from the people as they enter into the city for Passover, Judas sees an opportunity and he couldn't wait any longer. So he thought, if Jesus isn't going to act, then I'm going to do something. If these Pharisees want him so bad, then I'll set the stage for him to proclaim himself Messiah. I'll find the perfect time for these religious leaders to come and arrest him. I mean, after all, if he's the Messiah, there's no way he's going to let himself get arrested. And there's certainly no way he's going to let himself get executed. So Judas thinks he's helping move things along. But the only problem was Judas didn't get who Jesus was and he was expecting a military king. But Jesus, he had come to rule over a very different kind of kingdom. But by the end of the week, as Jesus is celebrating Passover with his disciples, he begins to even increase their expectation. He was about to announce his kingship even more because as they're having their last meal, he announces that he's establishing a brand new covenant. Uh, one that will replace the old covenant set up under Moses. And for, and for these Jewish young men, his disciples, who'd been raised and taught the law and the prophets, they all knew that the prophet Jeremiah had predicted that God would in fact declare a brand new covenant with, with his people. And here Jesus was indicating that now it's time. He was inaugurating this new covenant with all of mankind that God had promised long ago, a covenant that Jesus said would be established with his blood and and they're sitting around the table and they don't even understand what, what, he's, what he's meaning. And John goes on, he says that Jesus also gave us the terms and the conditions for this new covenant. He said we're based around what Jesus called a new command. That we are now to love one another the way that Jesus has loved us. Love each other not the way that you've been loved and not the way that you want people to love you. But love one another the way that Jesus has loved you. And and sitting around the table, they they didn't know what Jesus meant. But fast forward 24 hours or fast forward after the resurrection, it would become very clear because the very next day, Jesus would put on a demonstration while on the cross of exactly what love looks like. And so when they heard Jesus saying these things, they all thought this has got to be the time he's going to set himself up and proclaim himself king and Messiah. He's about to do something special for the nation. But what they could have never imagined was that Jesus wasn't just about to do something special for them. He was about to do something special for you and for me and for the whole world. And so they left that meal and they headed to a garden where Judas knew that Jesus was going to go. And Judas arrives there with soldiers and with a kiss He betrays his Messiah and Jesus is arrested and he's taken to the high priest where he's falsely accused and he's beaten. And then he's taken to the Roman governor Pilate because they want to make this arrest and execution happen quickly before the crowds realize what's going on. But Pilate can't find anything in Jesus that's worthy of death. And but the Jewish leaders just keep insisting that he's got to die And Pilate tries to find the middle ground and he decides that he'll have Jesus flogged and beaten within an inch of his life. But but for the Jewish leaders, that's not enough. He has to die. They say he's got to die because he claims to be the son of God. He's got to die because he claims to be a king. And, And Pilate, if you are any friend of Caesar's, you can't allow this man to live. And so Pilate finally gives in. And John tells us, in verse 16 of chapter 19, that the soldiers took charge of Jesus. And carrying his own cross, he went out to a hillside called Golgotha, which translates the place of the skull. And it was there that they crucified him. 
And John doesn't give any other details because no other details are necessary. Anybody who heard this story in the first and second century, they knew exactly what crucifixion looked like, sounded like, and smelled like. They had seen it for themselves. And so there he was crucified, John says, with two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. And John records Jesus' words on the cross. And, and in what follows, you know, he gives details that really are, aren't necessary unless everything he says is true. The, the, the amount of detail here is incredible. And one of those details that John records while Jesus was on the cross is John stood there gazing at Jesus, really wanting to look away with Mary, Jesus' mother, standing beside him. Jesus said to John, John, Mary is now your mother. And John and John, Mary, Mary is, John is now your son. And this was Jesus' way of saying, John, take care of my mom. And John said, I was there when I heard him utter his last words. It is finished. And John said, I watched as he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. And then John does the most unusual thing. And if you're reading this, it's easy to skip past this because you, you don't think this is a significant part, but it couldn't be more important because John pauses and he makes this statement and it's not for his immediate audience. No, 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 it's, it's for you and for me. It's for future generations because he tells us that the man who saw all of this, he's talking about himself. In other words, he's saying, I'm talking about me here. I saw all of this. I didn't hear about it. I didn't read about it. Nobody told me about it. I was there. I witnessed this with my own eyes. The man who saw it has given testimony. And what I'm about to tell you is true. This is exactly how this happened. I know that I tell the truth. And I'm telling you this, I'm testifying, he would say, so that, and this is the part that John would pause his immediate context and he would reach through the ages and he would grab us by the shoulders and he would look in our eyes and he would say, I'm telling you this so that you would believe he is who he said he is. So you also could believe. I'm writing so you would believe too, even though you weren't there to see it or to hear it. You can trust what I'm telling you because I was there. And at this point in the story, we would reply, what's to, to dispute? I mean, okay, so all we have so far is a wannabe Messiah who's being executed by Rome. So far, I believe, John, there's nothing that you said that, that, that really makes me wonder if you're telling me the truth because nobody in history has doubted whether Jesus was a real historical person who was executed by Rome. There's enough extra biblical evidence historically to prove that. But John would say, that's not the part that I need you to trust me on. It's what happens next that I need you to trust me on. Uh, that's what I want you to believe because it's the next part that might be a little hard to believe because you weren't there to see it. But I promise you that what I saw is true. My testimony is true. What happened next really happened. I was there and I saw it. And he continues in the story and he says, later after Jesus had died, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. And with Pilate's permission, he came and he took the body away. And there's so much detail here. It's hard to consider that he was making any of this up because these events really happened. And Joseph of Arimathea was a secret follower of Jesus. And he had to ask for Jesus' body because you couldn't bury a crucified body. It, it, they, they would throw the bodies of those crucified into a pile for the animals to clean the bones off. And so Joseph had to bribe Pilate and to give him money probably to get Jesus' body, to give him a proper burial. And so somebody else we learned was with Joseph, a guy who shows up earlier in John's gospel. He was accompanied, John says, by a man named Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and they were all there and used to embalm Jesus' body. Because like everybody else, nobody expected Jesus to raise from the dead. They all expected him to stay dead and they were doing what they needed to do to prepare the body. And so taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and, and in the strips that they had brought of linen, which was, John says, in accordance to Jewish burial customs. And John, he's saying this, and this was his way of saying, guys, I know that there are going to be people years from now who will read this story who have no frame of reference for Jewish burial customs. And so I'm going to include this to help you all understand that they were doing this and it was in line with our burial customs because this moment is so important. These strips of linen are so important to the story in just a minute because 
at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, John says, and in that garden was a new tomb, really a cave, and nobody had ever been laid there. And because it was the Jewish uh, day of preparation, the day before the Passover, and since the tomb was nearby, they put Jesus' body there. And this was John's way of saying, we were in a hurry. Uh, the sun was about to go down on Friday night and the Sabbath was about to begin. And, and if the sun had gone down and we had continued working, none of what we were doing would be lawful. So we finished the burial as quickly as we could and we put his body in the tomb and we rolled the stone in front of the, the entrance and then we left. And John and Peter and Joseph and Nicodemus and all the other disciples, they disappeared. And we don't know what John or Peter or any of the other disciples did or, or talked about on that night. We don't know what they were doing, where they went, really. But we do know that they were thinking, no doubt, that the last three years of their life had been a waste. All of what they had hoped for couldn't ever be a reality now. The tomb had sealed all of their hopes. They were dead. He was dead. And the fact that Jesus was arrested and executed so quickly, it meant that he couldn't have been who he claimed to be. I mean, we don't know what they did on Friday or on Saturday. But John tells us that early Sunday morning, they were awakened to somebody banging on the door where they were hiding. And, and it wasn't the Roman soldiers as they feared it would be. No, it was a woman. It was Mary Magdalene. And she was one of Jesus' most devoted followers. She followed Jesus because he had delivered her and performed an incredible miracle for her. And she was so grateful for Jesus. And so She loved him dearly. And she was, she was so brokenhearted when he was crucified. And she's banging on the door and she's sobbing. And when John opens the door, this is what she said. They have taken the body. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. I don't know where they have put him. In other words, she's saying, we went to the tomb to make sure that his body was properly prepared for burial because we know that you guys had to rush on Friday. But when we got there, the stone had been rolled away. And when we looked inside the tomb, there wasn't a body. And she, like anybody else, would just assume what everybody else assumed. Not, not a miracle, not a resurrection. Nobody writes themselves into the story here as believers or as heroes. None of them believed that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. She looked into that tomb and she assumed that somebody had stolen the body. Somebody had taken the body. And I, we don't know where they are, whoever they are. We don't know where they have taken him. And in this moment before where they were hiding, John and Peter were hiding out of fear. Now, in the urgency of the moment, John tells us that they ran to the place where they knew that Jesus' body had been put. And John tells us that Peter and the other disciple, he's speaking of himself here, that, they, that we started out for the tomb. And both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and he reached the tomb first. Now, this is a funny detail, an interesting detail, but what you need to know is that when John writes these, uh, his account, writes these words, he's an old man, years after the resurrection, and Peter and John were very close friends. And by the time that John is, is writing this gospel, Peter has been executed by Emperor Nero under a great persecution in the church, and that happened years before this. And so years later now, John feels like it's a safe thing to include this detail. It's kind of funny because he says, all right, I can say this now because he's, he's not around to you know, beat me up or, or get angry at me, but I outran him. I was faster than him. And I can relate to this because my twin brother, Jeremy, and I, we grew up competing over who was faster, right? We would always compete for this. And, and so I imagine in some way, this is John kind of finally saying, I think it's time that everybody knows I was faster than Peter. And I got there first. But when I got there, he says, when I, I bent over and I looked in at the strips of linen lying there, I didn't go in. Why didn't John go in? It was dark. It was a tomb. Would you have gone in? He was scared. He was confused. I love the honesty in these accounts. And he, it's, it's almost like he's saying, I know that I was faster than Peter, but once I got there first, I chickened out, man. And I, and I was confused and I was scared and I couldn't go into the tomb. I couldn't bring myself to go into the tomb. And then he says that finally Simon Peter caught up with me and he came along behind and he went straight into the tomb. And why does Peter go straight into the tomb? Because that's what Simon Peter does. Peter doesn't wait for permission. He just does. He just speaks. He, he, he asks for permission later. Peter always got himself in trouble because he spoke too soon or he acted too quickly. And so Peter doesn't even hesitate. Peter goes straight into the tomb. And John says, 
Here's what we saw. He's, we saw the strangest thing. Nobody expected this. Because when somebody steals a body, they steal the body and they take everything with it. They don't leave evidence behind. But in that moment, what we saw convinced us something unique had happened. We saw the strips of linen still lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around his head. The cloth still lying in its place, separate from the linen. It wasn't a mess. And this wasn't a rush job. Thieves wouldn't take the time to unembalm a body and carefully fold all the linens. And John says, finally, the other disciple, again, speaking of himself, the one who outran Peter to the tomb, I went inside too. And I saw for myself. And when he saw the empty tomb and he saw all the linens lying there that had been wrapped around Jesus' body, carefully placed where the body had been, folded carefully. He put two and two together. And in this moment, he said he saw and he believed. His world changed in that moment because if Jesus was alive, then it dawned on him that everything that Jesus had ever said was true. Everything Jesus had ever taught about God and heaven and hell and sin and forgiveness and love, all of it, all of it was true. Everything that he had ever claimed to be about himself, the son of man, the son of God, the resurrection and the life, all of it was true. Their hope wasn't dead. Their hope was alive because by his own power, Jesus has done the most incredible thing. He has raised himself from the dead and he, by his own power, has walked out of this very grave. I think in that moment, John, I think it dawned on him that I don't know where he is, but clearly he's risen from the dead. And I think he went back in his mind to the events on Friday. I, I, I was there. I saw him crucified. I saw him die. I saw him embalmed. I saw him put in this tomb. And now I'm standing in his tomb and he's not here. And the linens are. I, he's alive. He is risen from the dead. And suddenly everything aligns for John. If he's alive, that means everything is true. This great merciful, gracious God has in fact stepped down from his glorious throne in heaven and he has dwelt among us and he did it not to condemn us or to show us how bad we are, but so that he could wear our sin and wear our shame and carry it on himself and take it to the cross. He is our king. He is our deliverer. He is our Messiah. And he didn't come to set us free from Rome. No, 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 no. He came to set us free from the thing that is even greater, what we're in bondage to even more than Rome, our own sin. And this was John's message. That in the beginning was the word. And he can't explain it all. Don't ask me to explain it all. All I can explain is that in some way, the word, which was God, became flesh and dwelt among us through the person of Jesus. And it was as if every day the light of the world entered the world and lit up the world for us to see. And on that very first Easter morning, when I realized that Jesus had risen from the dead, it all made sense. It all came together for me. And later that same day, John and Peter and all and most of the other disciples, they saw Jesus alive. In that very same room where they had shared that last meal together, Jesus appears to them and John records the conversation. But there's one conversation that happens after this that I, I want to, before we close this morning, I want to talk about and read to you. Because when Jesus was crucified, everybody knew the game was over. There was, there was no movement to keep moving. There was no cause to keep fighting for. After he was killed, all of his disciples scattered. And we don't know where everybody went. We know John and Peter hid somewhere in the city. We know that some of the others went to, back to Bethany where Lazarus lived. But we don't know where everybody else went. And one of those disciples named Thomas, John tells us that now Thomas, one of the 12, wasn't with the other disciples when Jesus came the very first time and appeared to them in that room. So the other disciples, when they finally saw Thomas, they said, we have seen the Lord. So, so Jesus' sightings are beginning to circulate all over the city of Jerusalem and all over the surrounding area. And apparently wherever Thomas has gone to hide, Wherever he's run off to hide, he hears about. And so he makes his way back to the city of Jerusalem and he reconnects with all the other disciples. And when they see him, John and the others, they, they, they were like, Thomas, where have you been? We have seen the Lord. He's alive. He's resurrected. We have seen him with our own eyes. But Thomas isn't superstitious. Thomas feels like he has just spent the last three years of his life chasing a false messiah. He's not about to spend the rest of his life chasing a rumor. 
So Thomas said, unless I see the, the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand where, 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 where the wound was in his side, I will not believe. Guys, in other words, guys, I love you, but it's not enough. I think you might be seeing things, but I can't believe unless I see it for myself. And John tells us, I love the details about this story. John tells us it was about a week later. His disciples were in the same room in the house again. And this time Thomas was with them. And John says, I know this sounds odd, but I'm just telling you this is how it happened. And I'm asking you to trust that my testimony is true. Like before, when Jesus appeared to all of us, uh, well, most of us, Thomas wasn't there. When he appeared to us in that room, it, it, the, the doors were locked just like the first time. Though the doors were locked, I need you to trust me on this. Jesus entered the room, though the, the doors were locked a second time, just like he did before. And he stood among us and he said, peace be with you. And of course he said, peace be with you, because just like the first time, he scared us all to death. We, didn't, we weren't expecting him to just show up. And then in this moment, John says he looked at Thomas and he says, put your finger here and feel. See my hands? Reach out your hand and touch my side. In other words, Thomas, it's me. It's real. This is happening. And I love this next part because now that he sees Jesus with his own eyes, he tells Thomas, stop doubting believe. And I think John includes this part of the story because it goes back to the theme that he's been hitting on throughout his entire gospel. So that you wouldn't doubt, so that you would believe that this testimony is true. Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. He saw with his own eyes and so he believed and had faith. And John wants you to, because you weren't there to see it or to hear it, he wants you to trust the eyewitness account of what they saw and what they heard so you would believe. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. In other words, Thomas, I understand why you doubted. I get it. I understand why you couldn't believe. Thomas, you're just like the rest of these guys. And don't let these guys give you a hard time. Don't let them give you a nickname like Doubting Thomas, right? Because I'm, I'm promising you, none of these guys believed that I was alive either until they saw me. They didn't believe in a resurrection until they saw me alive in front of them. But now you see. So don't doubt. Believe. And then Jesus, I think he's, he leaves this context of the group in front of him. And I think he speaks to you and to me throughout the ages. I think he speaks knowing that this story would be told for generations and generations and for centuries with you in mind and with me in mind. He says to that group gathered there that day, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You believe, Thomas, because you can see. But blessed are those who are going to come after you John, after you, after you, Peter, and who will believe because of what you say. They will believe, they, they, they will be asked to believe based on the testimony of each of you. John, blessed are you, and blessed are those who read your gospel when they read what you have to say about what you saw. Peter, blessed are those who read what you told Mark and what Mark recorded. Blessed are those. And, 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 and John, John, Mark, goodness, goodness, Matthew, blessed are those who, who read what you have to say. Blessed are all those in the future who read this and hear this. And even though they haven't seen it with their own eyes, choose to believe. And that's the invitation that Jesus gave John and all the others that day. And that's the invitation that John gives you and me. And the invitation is very simple. It's what he's been saying throughout his entire gospel. I want you to trust that what I'm telling you is true because I was there to see it. You weren't, but I was. And, you, and I was there to hear it. You weren't, but I was. So you can trust that what I'm sharing with you is true. But if you trust me and you believe what I'm telling you to be true, then I want you to take it one more step. And I want you to put your faith in Jesus. I want you to believe like I do, that he really is the son of God. This is how John said it, that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, in his gospel. But he tells us that these are written, the things that he included, the things that we've been walking through and talking about over the last seven weeks. All these miracles, all these signs, I didn't include them so you would only know what Jesus did. I included them so you would know who Jesus really is. All of these have been written 
so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name too. So why do you believe what you believe about Jesus? I wonder if your opinion is tied to something that has nothing to do with who he really is. And here John shares his own eyewitness account of what he saw and what he heard so that you and I could have confidence to believe that Jesus really is who he claimed to be. Because as John would say on that very first Easter morning, that sealed and authenticated the promise that God had made through Jesus, when his buried body began to breathe, and out of the silence of that tomb that we thought would be quiet forever, the roaring lion, the Messiah, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, and the Son of God would come out of that grave and would declare for you and for me that the grave no longer has power over us. Our sin no longer has the last say because God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't be lost to God because of their sin. They wouldn't perish, but they would have eternal life. That was Jesus' invitation to John. That's John's invitation to you and to me. And my hope for you on this Easter Sunday, that faith for you would be personal too. And like John, and like me, and like so many others, that you would believe and that you would have life in his name too. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for preserving this text for us for over 2,000 years. And thank you for patiently walking with John and the other disciples to help them see who you really are. And I know that as I share this message on this Easter Sunday to so many of my friends who are watching online, I know that I'm talking to some who already believe and they have been believers for years. I pray that this would incre increase their faith and inspire them to live a life that is truly full of the love of God. But I pray for those who are watching right now who maybe they used to believe. or Maybe they can't seem to ever get to that point where they believe, even if they wanted to, because of something that's happened. I pray that they would take John's words to heart. And that regardless of their experiences, they would see through the fog of what's happened or maybe through the fog of fear to see a God who loves them and who sent their, his one and only son for them so that they wouldn't perish or be lost to God, but that they would be found and that they would have eternal life. And so this morning, if you're listening and you know that you want something you can't give yourself, you know you, you need someone that you aren't enough to fill. You need a God. You need a Savior. You need forgiveness. You need a Lord and a Messiah and a leader to guide you from where you are to where you know God wants your life to be. Then I invite you this morning to believe in Jesus and to call on his name right now where you're sitting in your living room or wherever you might be and tell Jesus that I believe in you. You are the Son of God sent to save me and I need you, please forgive me now. Come into my life and be the Lord and the leader. Be, be God to me. I receive you, Jesus, because I believe in you. And by believing, I pray that you would feel the peace that should come to all of our hearts when we know we have life in his name. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this morning for Easter at Hope Church KC Online. Join us next week as we start a brand new series that answers the question, where is God when life is dark? Our brand new series called Night that will start next Sunday at 10 a.m. We'll see you then.